And I would notice over the years, no matter where I was working, whatever market I worked in and whatever station I worked for, there was always that don't make the sponsors, the people paying for the commercials mad. <laughs> Today is a former television news journalist and now candidate for governor of the great state of Arizona, Carrie Lake. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Hi, Dave. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Carrie, I have to start very obviously. My audience is going to hear former television journalists. They're going to freak out because they don't like journalists. Am I, am I allowed to call you a former journalist without using air quotes? Because, you know, journalists these days, I think you get it. I, well, I, I came up through uh, the old school of journalism where you, you told both sides of the story. If there were three sides, you told all three sides and you kept your opinions out. And that's why I walked away from my career. I, I started in journalism 30 years ago and that's how you did it. And now we've increasingly seen journalists moving on out, being replaced with propagandists. And I was uh, at the top of my game, number one in ratings for pretty much my entire time covering Arizona. Most recently, 22 years at the Fox affiliate. Number one that whole time, making a fortune. Had a pretty good life and then COVID struck and I realized there are no good guys in the corporate media. If there were good guys, they would have covered ivermectin, told us about hydroxychloroquine. They would have been honest about the election and the corruption involved in that. And I, I just, you know, I looked up in my career and said, oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be part of this. It was getting increasingly more difficult to be honest with the people of Arizona. And if I couldn't speak 100% truth, I didn't want to be part of it. So I walked away. I, I do think there are some good journalists out there. The ones you're seeing on the corporate media, unfortunately, are mainly propagandists today. Do you remember a moment that you started getting an inkling of all that? Did it really start with COVID? Or I suspect in 22 years, you probably saw some other hints leading to where we got to today? You know, the news has increasingly been moving toward the left, obviously, over the past many decades. And, and I just always felt like, well, as long as I keep what comes out of my mouth and when I'm being a journalist, I can keep that straight on the straight and narrow and make sure that I'm being fair. I can't always be responsible for everybody else that works in the industry, but I know I can be responsible for myself. And I really truly felt that I could do that for the most part, almost all the time. And so that's what kept me going in my career. You know, there's always that, that I guess it would be the law of television broadcasting and really any uh, news entity, they want to protect their sponsors. And I would notice over the years, no matter where I was working, whatever market I worked in and whatever station I worked for, there was always that don't make the sponsors, the people paying for the commercials mad. For example, if a big uh, car, car company in town, uh, if there was a scandal somehow, it was always, you know, pulling teeth to get management to want to cover something like that. They would maybe cover it if they had to, but it would be a short 20 second version of the story rather than covering it ad nauseum like they would if it was somebody who wasn't a sponsor. And looking back, you, you see things like that and you go, wow, that's a really dangerous thing because we saw this during COVID. These news outlets took hundreds of millions of dollars from Fauci and Big Pharma and you almost saw it happening. You almost saw it like this, like a, somebody flipped a switch and they all started talking so positively about the vaccines. And there was no critical coverage of it. Now, I'm not trying to be judgmental on a vaccine, but it is our responsibility as journalists to put out the truth and not to tout a product and not to uh, refuse to cover the dangerous side effects because the people are counting on truth from journalism, at least they used to. And so when you see all these TV people and, and newspaper people putting out only the positives and trying to shame people into getting shots but not covering the true side effects, and there are some very dangerous side effects with these shots, I believe they have blood on their hands. And I'm so thankful that I got out before that business started up because I was watching that happen with horror, knowing uh, specifically people who had terrible side effects and actually blamed uh, relatives' deaths on those shots, and then sitting there and watching journalists tout them and, and pump them up like they were the greatest thing. I think it's uh, disgraceful and hinging on criminal. 
Are you amazed how they can sort of do it right in front of our eyes? I don't know if you've seen that compilation that was going viral for a while. We've shown it a couple times on my show where they show you all the outros to the commercials, the intros and outros to the commercials on mainstream media, CNN, CBS Morning News, et cetera, et cetera. Brought to you by Pfizer. The same people who are telling you how wonderful Pfizer is the entire time. I thought at one time we were supposed to be skeptical about this stuff. I saw that. I saw that compilation. At first, I didn't believe it because sometimes you see these compilations yeah. and you go, that can't be true. But yep. I was just watching. I was uh, leaving uh, North Carolina a day ago and I was watching one of the major networks morning show and they were talking about uh, the teen suicide rate and teen mental illness and all of that. And and they did a whole segment on it and what to look out for. You know, they didn't talk about what caused a lot of it, which was mm -hmm. these uh, draconian shutdowns and lockdowns and quarantines unnecessarily and the masking of our teenagers, which wasn't needed and caused all kinds of mental problems and sending them home. They didn't talk about that. They just talked about how we've got teens with a bunch of emotional issues now. And right out of it was an ad for, I forget which big pharma, about a drug for um, depression and suicide and all of that. Say. And I'm like, wow, it's so obvious once your eyes are woken up to it. But some people just aren't awake yet, Dave. Some people are not awake. There's a lot of woke people, just not a lot of awake people. That, that seems to be the problem. Uh, you did an event about two weeks ago here in Florida. I was gonna try to get there and then something popped up, but you were at Mar-a-Lago with a, a certain orange man who will play a 10 <laughs> second, we'll play a quick 10 second clip. Here's what he had to say about you. But I will say that uh, I think that's gonna be one of the great things that I've done endorsing a woman and helping her get elected, and I think she'll go down as the greatest governor in our country. All right, so it looks like you've got, or not looks like, you've got the endorsement of Trump, you've done events with him. Um, well, how does that feel relative to getting into politics for the first time and just the general state of craziness and the circus that is our political machine? Well, that soundbite uh, you just played was just, um, it, it felt really good to hear that because I, I do plan on being the best governor, best governor Arizona's ever seen. I'll probably be the first governor Arizona's ever seen that truly was in it for the right reasons to represent the great people of this state. So when he said he's gonna, one of his greatest accomplishments will be to help get me elected and, and he knows I'll become the greatest, uh, one of the greatest governors in the country, um, that made me feel really good because I'm in this for the right reason. I Trust me, there's no reason you'd want to get into the corrupt world of the swampy politics unless you're doing it for the right reason. I, I'm not in it for the fame. There's no money in it if you're an honest person and you're not trying to you know, bilk the taxpayers out of their money. Um, I'm just doing this because I love Arizona. And I looked at the field of people who was running, Dave, and I believe this is the last election in this country. If we don't get it right, and we don't get some America first people in there running, some honest citizen politicians, I don't know that we'll have a country beyond this election. So I looked at the field of who was running, and it's the typical rhino, uh, career politician, somebody who's run before, lost 20 years ago. We have somebody who's run before and run against Katie Hobbs, who's gonna be the Democrat socialist that we end up running against. And he already lost to her a few years ago. So I looked at the field of Republicans running and I said, not a single one of them can get us past the finish line. And if we lose this election and we get a Katie Hobbs, who is a socialist Democrat, we will lose Arizona and we cannot as a country afford to lose another border state. We've are, we'll be stuck with just Texas holding the line for us and we need to get strong governors in these border states to hold the line for America. We are about to lose our country. If we don't have fair elections and honest elections and we don't have a border, then we do not have a country. So this race is critical and that's why I'm in it. So I wanna jump back to the border stuff in just a sec, but can you talk a little bit about what generally is going on in Arizona? I think most people think of Arizona and they're like, no, no, it should be a red state. It seems like it's a red state but it doesn't fully seem to be a red state. It really, as you're saying, could go either way. It's a little hard to understand what the electorate is, is really made up of there or where they're really going. Well, let me tell you, Arizona is as red as my shirt, okay? It's a red state. <laughs> but when we have corrupt elections that are stolen, where we have uh, mail-in ballots being sent out to people who don't even live here and filled out and sent in, and we have ballot trafficking, and we have... Uh, more voters than even registered voters voting, 
then we're going to have a corrupt election that makes it look like we aren't a red state. And that's why it is imperative that we get to the bottom of this election and we do not allow another election to be stolen. It's not about Republican, Democrat, Independent. It's about having honest elections and, and saving our country. So we're a red state, absolutely. We have a lot of people coming over from California. Believe it or not, a lot of them are conservatives who are fleeing. Mm -hmm. They're political refugees coming in from Oregon and, and Washington, California, and other blue states. And of course, we do have some coming in who are bringing their liberal ideology with them, and we're really not interested in becoming California. So um, we are a very conservative state, a wild west state. Um, we've got an uh, issue with our border that does not remain here in Arizona. When we have people flowing across, people being trafficked, drugs being trafficked, they move to other states beyond Arizona. I was just in North Carolina for the Trump rally, and the good people of North Carolina, I think their number one issue is the border. They were chanting, build the wall, finish the wall in North Carolina. Think how far they are from the border. Mm -hmm. This is a, an issue that is an American issue, not just an Arizona issue. And we've got to get a strong governor in who is going to finish the wall, send troops to the border, and secure our border for the rest of the country as well. How did this happen with the border, do you think? I mean, we've been covering this a lot and reading off the numbers, and it's gotten significantly worse under Biden, obviously. But what happened in Arizona and Texas that allowed so much of this, that allowed so many people to come in and not just come in, but they come in illegally and then they're shipped to other states. I don't know if you've seen, but my governor yeah. here in Florida, DeSantis, any, any illegals that they ship here, he's shipping them to Delaware. I highly <laughs> recommend, I highly recommend you institute a policy like that uh, once you're governor. But what, what do you think happened in Arizona that led to this? Well, I have a better idea. We're not letting them in in the first place. We're going to keep them from coming in and we're going to find them when they're here. We're going to send them back across the border. That way our tax money is not going to pay for them. Um, what happened was Joe Biden. And what happened before that was a corrupt election that got Joe Biden into office. And Joe Biden came in and on day one, he stripped back a border policy that was the most effective border policy I've ever seen in my 27 plus years of Arizona. I covered Arizona for 27 years. I covered the border for many, all of those years. And we never saw it better than when President Trump was in charge. He had secured our border, the best I'd ever seen it. And on day one, Joe Biden came and tore that back, completely exposed us to a criminal element, handed over control of our border to narco terrorists, and they immediately started to bring in people from all over the world, not just Mexico and Central America. People from 160 countries are pouring in, coming up through our southern border, and Joe Biden's pretty much giving them citizenship by what he's done. And it's going to stop when I'm governor. We are going to shut it down. We're going to finish the wall. And we're, you know, have you seen the video of, of all of that material that we've already paid for? I was just oh, yeah. down there. and it's, it's outrageous. I was down there in southern Arizona walking next to it. It goes on for a mile. It's stacked up probably 20 feet high. And it's just uh, materials for building the wall sitting there in the desert. We're going to take that back under my border plan. We're going to uh, redefine what it means to have abandoned federal property. And we're going to use that to finish the wall. We paid for it. We paid for that material. And we're also going to send our Arizona National uh, Guard down to the border. We're going to arm them because we're not going to put them up against these cartel members without uh, arming them. And we're going to have them push people back and not allow people to come across our border. If we catch them, we arrest them for trespassing, detain them, process them, and send them back across the border. And we do have the right to do that. We're gonna ask other states who are interested, like-minded states to chip in and help. Maybe they send their state guard down and we will use them and utilize them at the border to make sure we have enough manpower on the border. Our constitution allows for this, Dave. The Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, the Guarantee Clause, it requires the federal government protect us from invasion. And when they fail to do that, in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, the states have the power to take control, it's almost state war power, to take control of their troops and stop the invasion, which we intend to do beginning on day one of my administration. Do you sense that that's kind of the future of America, not just talking about borders, but in general, that we'll return to some level of federalism that we were intended to, where the state 
that you live in, in some ways will be more important than the federal government. I mean, that's really the way the whole thing was set up. It doesn't seem to be the way we, we think we're supposed to be governed, but I sense that coming back. I can tell you from living in California for the last eight years to where I live in Florida right now, it is, it is like living in a completely different country. And I'm actually okay with that. <laughs> we're gonna learn the weak states versus the strong states. You could call it the blue states versus the red states. And I agree with you. I mean, we realized during COVID just how strong the states were. We, we've handed over way too much power, by the way, to the federal government. So it's about time we bring that power back to the states. But we learned when our governors exerted their power against the people during COVID, how much power they had. Unfortunately, they used that power to torture us, to shut our businesses down, to shut our churches down, to send our schools um, closing and sending our kids home. They forced our kids to mask up. They forced people to get shots against their will. So they use that power in the most devious way, in my opinion. I plan to use that power to strengthen Arizona, protect Arizona, and give the power back to the people. And, and you can see it as, as broad as daylight when you go to a Florida, when you go to a red state, when you go to a state like California where these terrible uh, radical leftist policies have been in play for 40 plus years in California. They've completely destroyed what used to be a once great state. And so I believe going back to state power is the way to go, to go back to our sovereignty. We created the federal government. They didn't create us and we are sovereign, not serfs of the federal government. What do your opponents say? What like when you're talking to the Democrats or if they're just talking about you, maybe they're not talking to you. I mean, what are they saying on the border that, I mean, is any, are they saying anything that resonates with people or that makes sense? Like what is, what is the policy of a border state Democrat at this point? Well, I'm actually impressed with um, that we're leading the charge. My campaign is, I've been on day one talking about the border calling it an invasion, calling it what it is. And now my Republican opponents are now jumping and even stealing parts of my plan, which is fine because my plan is the best plan out there for securing the border. So I'm actually pushing the, the uh, just the entire discussion on what we need to do across the country even. I've had other people reach out to me and say, can I take a look at your plan? We might want to implement it here. I have sent it over to our current governor, Doug Ducey, and said, please implement this immediately. We can't wait until I'm voted into office. We can't wait until January of 23. We need to start this right away. He never responded to that. I hope if he's listening that he will take a look at it and implement it immediately. It's the only way we can protect the good people of Arizona and of America. Um, the Democrats, of course, are open borders. I mean, they, they love what's going on. They think that we should be bringing everybody in and taking on the world's problems. And that is why it is so critical I think Arizona is the most important state, the most important governor's race in the country because we cannot afford to lose another red state to these radicals on the left. And I don't even want to call them Democrats anymore because the Democrat Party from you know the JFK era is completely gone. This is Marxism, socialism, and they have every intention, Dave, of if they were to get into office, completely ceding the border to the uh, narco-terrorists and cartels, and I cringe to think what would happen. We'd have to all rent U-Hauls and escape Arizona. I used to think they were just inept, and now I'm, I'm with you, I think it's intentional. Um, you mentioned America first, and that is the, the sort of the Trump movement motto, and I think Trump is obviously uh, trying to figure out where he fits into that with his political future. Perhaps you know something that uh, people would like to know. Um, but what, what does America first mean to you? I can sense on the border side, but what does it mean broadly? It means putting the citizens of this great country first. And, and you know, that sounds like people go, well, well, we do that. No, we haven't been doing that. For a full generation, the political elite have sold out America. They sold out our, our companies and our manufacturing overseas, sent it to China. They sold, and when they did that, by the way, they started the destruction of the America family. You know, I, I grew up in, in many, in the 70s and 80s in the Midwest, in Iowa. I, at one point during the 80s, I remember almost all of my friends' fathers got laid off. They worked in, in manufacturing and plants and, and all of those plants got shut down and they started to move overseas. And that started the destruction of the American family because when your dad loses a good paying job and all of a sudden he can't find work and it leads to substance abuse and all kinds of issues, it leads to 
uh, just the, uh, I believe, the disintegration of, of the American family and our communities. And so we've been being sold out for a long time by our political elite. And I don't know why they did it, if they were just trying to help uh, the next quarterly report for the corporations or if they got there was something in it for them. But we've been sold out by our political leaders. And finally, when President Trump came in, we saw what the America First movement was. It was about returning business to America, reshoring manufacturing, putting the needs of our American citizens first. And I believe that is the only way out of the mess we're in, restoring our freedoms to Americans. During COVID, we watched as people gave away their freedoms. And we, you know, we, we watched as people said, okay, I'll mask up, okay, I'll get the shot, okay, I'll do that. Every single time we give away a freedom, we've got to fight to get it back. And we're at a point where we're standing up and fighting and we're gonna take it back. We're at the 11th hour to save this country and if we do not stand up and speak out and risk being canceled and persecuted, who cares if they, if they call you names? We gotta stand up and, and fight to take our freedoms back and, and push these Marxists to the, to the edges and tell them we don't want them anymore. They're not gonna be controlling our kids' curriculum. They're not gonna be controlling our businesses anymore and shutting them down. We have to bring America First policies back and save this country. How nasty do you think that fight between the America First crew and sort of the, the rhino crew or the swamp crew or the traditional Republican crew is gonna get? Because I, I spend most of my time on this show trying to expose the woke thing to people and have people wake up and say, hey, we can set aside some of those differences on the right and figure some of that stuff out. But you can feel a fight really brewing there between the America First thing and whatever you wanna call it, the rhino swamp thing, whatever it is. Especially in Arizona, there's a, there's remnants of the kind of the McCain camp here still, which is really rhino. And uh, we have rhinos like Jeff Flake and all of that. So we, the, we have a, a pretty big swamp here in Arizona and they're on their last gasps of air, but they are fighting. The devil doesn't go down easy. <laughs> he, he fights back. And, and so I'm really feeling it. I mean, they're running attack ads on me. They've been doing so since um, August when I jumped. They realized when I jumped in the race, that I was a force to be contended with and that I was soaring in the polls. They have poured millions of dollars into this race to try to bring me down. And this is the swamp. This is the swamp, not just from Arizona. I found out that one of the guys sitting on the super PAC running ads against me is a rhino from Michigan, who most likely may have been involved in that fraudulent election up there. They're scared to death to have a Trump Republican who is bound and determined to bring justice for our corrupt election in 2020. We're not gonna let people walk. If they defrauded the voters of Arizona, we find out who they are, they will be held accountable. And they don't want someone like me in office. So it's gonna be a knockdown drag out fight, but I've got, um, you know, I've got a message for them. I am a fighter. And when I set my sights on something, I make it happen and I'm not afraid to be called names. I'm not afraid for them to attack me. I, I, I'm going to stand tall for Arizona and stand strong for Arizona. And I don't care what they say about me. We're going to win this and we're going to get Arizona back on track. And the days of the rhinos and the swamp are done. Now, I'm not saying I won't work with an establishment Republican. If, if they want to come together and work with the America First movement and, and be all about making Arizona the greatest state in the country, then I'm all for it. I want to bring people together. I want to bring even Democrats who are waking up to the insanity of the left and this you know, fringe group on the left who are trying to drag this country down. Those people who are waking up, I want them on our team as well. We need to grow this conservative movement, this America First movement, and just finally do right by the people of this state. You've mentioned election integrity a couple of times and fraudulent election, I think you said. You know, it's funny, I had Blake Masters on, who, as you know, is running for Senate as a Republican in Arizona, and he mentioned it as well. And it's, you know, most people are, are afraid to talk about it or don't want to talk about it. I suppose YouTube could blow up my channel just uh -oh. because you put those two words together right then and there. Don't worry, I got some backups, I'll be okay. Okay. Um, but, but what is going on in Arizona in terms of securing the election that, or what, or what were the things, I suppose, that really set off the bells, the alarms for you, and has anything been fixed? And I ask that because the two candidates that I've had from Arizona have both brought it up. 
Well, we're not perfect yet. We're not there for 22, no way. Um, I've been involved. I've thrown myself into a, a Arizona Supreme Court case, which unfortunately the court decided not to take up. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to risk everything to make sure our elections are honest. Some of the people in politics said, oh, don't get involved in that because you're trying to get rid of mail-in ballots and, and mail-in voting is very popular. And I said, I'm not trying to do the popular thing. I'm trying to do the right thing. And so I jumped into that case. Unfortunately, the Arizona Supreme Court didn't have the courage to take that up. I'm getting involved in uh, an injunction that uh, uh, we're going to ask for an emergency injunction against these corrupt uh, voting machines. And um, I'm not afraid to jump into this fight. This is a fight worth taking. This is a hill worth dying on because if we don't have secure elections, we can't accomplish anything. We can't make sure our kids' curriculum is secure. We can't make sure our border is secure. If, if they're installing people into office and we're not getting the people we actually vote for, then we've lost our country. So um, we did get some legislation passed that is going to require you to show proof of citizenship, basically an ID and a social security card. Right now, we had 16,000 people on our voter rolls who had no uh, driver's license and no f last four digits of their social security. That is an indication they were probably illegal voters. And there were 16,000 of them on the voter rolls. As you know, Joe Biden only allegedly won by just over 10,000 votes. So that's the margin of, of you know victory, I guess you could say. We have a ton of problems. We've had millions of election files deleted. We have election and state laws that were broken. We have 740,000 ballots that had no chain of custody. Those should be voided out ballots. If there's no chain of custody, they need to be voided out and they were counted. President Trump, I believe, won Arizona by a landslide. And I'm not trying to be the typical politician who always says the things that the consultants want you to say. I'm not doing that. I am saying what is true. And I was talking to President Trump. He was kind of chuckling. He said, I love you. You, you never back down from a fight. And you could ask Carrie what the weather's like, and she'll somehow find a way to talk about the stolen election in Arizona. <laughs> but we have to do that because stolen elections have consequences. And all of the troubles we're facing in this country, Dave, stem from that corrupt, rigged election. Are, are you worried that a certain set of people just don't want to talk about it? Or, or I guess more so are just afraid to talk about it because they don't want channels deleted. They don't want to get banned from Twitter and Facebook and everything else. That as righteous as you may believe it is, that it's just like one of those things where people are just like, ah, we got to move on, something like that. We can't move on. I mean, I wish, I wish it were that easy. Honest to God, I wish we could say that, but we can't. It's, if, if we do move on, that next election will be the last election. It'll be rigged, and then the next one rigged, and there we go. We're not a, a country anymore. Um, so we can't move on. But that being said, we're going to do everything we can, and we're going to fight to make it right. We're going to fight to make it honest. So I, I, I'm not worried about being censored. I have been censored before. I think more information is going to continue to come out. I mean, we were in Mar-a-Lago, and we saw the movie Rigged which um, Dave Bossie put together with Citizens yep. United, really important movie talking about the Zuckerberg money that was poured in. You know, we, it, we can't have that. We can't have a billionaire a tech tyrant pouring in almost half a billion dollars to get Joe Biden elected. This is wrong. This needs to be outlawed, that kind of, that kind of money being poured in to, for one candidate, basically. And we're about to see the 2,000 Mules come out, Dinesh D'Souza's movie, and I think that's going to be a real eye-opener for the people of this country. And if we can just get some honest elections in there and get some people who want to get in and make sure that we get the laws in place to make sure every election going forward is honest, then we're going to have, uh, I think, great policies moving forward and we'll have great elected officials, not these lifelong losers who we have in office right now. Are you telling me that the $450 million that Zuckerberg spent wasn't just to be nice, that he might have had an uh, intention with that money? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. He wasn't trying to help President Trump, let me put it that way. <laughs> not, neither were the folks in the media who ran just attack piece, hit piece after hit piece on Trump and refused to cover Joe Biden's, or I should say uh, his son's laptop from hell. Um, it's just been nonstop. And you know, that's really where it first started for me in the, in, the, in the media. I started to see 
my my colleagues in, in all of the media start to lose their mind when President Trump came on the scene. And that's when I realized, wow, there is a serious, seriously biased people here who are trying to destroy this president, who is a transformative president trying to help. Can you talk about some of the energy around that? Because I went to a Trump rally by accident. I actually happened to pass a Trump rally in Beverly Hills, right by Rodeo Drive, pretty woman, Rodeo Drive in the summer of 2020. I, ha I wasn't publicly supporting Trump at that time. I was kind of going in that direction, but I had never seen it. But I go to one of these rallies. He wasn't there. It was just the Beverly Hills Trump rally. And I saw what was the happiest, most joyous, music, dancing, American flags everywhere, truly diverse in the right sense of diverse thing I had ever seen before. And that was one of the things that finally sort of got me over the hump related to Trump. You've been in there in, in the middle of it with the energy and all that. Can you talk about just what that thing is like? It is amazing. It is such a beautiful show of patriotism and love for America. Of course, everyone at those events loves President Trump. He's the reason they're there. But you're watching people, and I was just in North Carolina um, at, at the most recent Trump rally. You watch people show up early. It's not easy to get to these places. Sometimes they're in out of the way towns and they drive a long time to get there. They park a long way back. They walk. They're there for hours. I'm talking seven, eight, nine hours. Sometimes it's cold. This isn't just a light level of commitment to President Trump. This is a deep, deep commitment and love for a man who put them first, who put working class Americans first, who put our families first, who put our rights first. So this is a deep love. And if people think that the Trump movement is gone, they've got their head buried in the sand. It is alive and well, and it is growing by the day. I actually get, I almost get a little emotional when I get to these sometimes because I look out at the sea of Americans who, who love America. And you know, it doesn't matter what color their skin is, doesn't matter what their religion is, doesn't matter where they came from. They might be immigrants. They might have parents who were immigrants. They might be seventh generation Americans. And they're there because the thing that binds us together is, is that common thread that we love America. And that's why the left and the radicals on the left are trying to destroy that and make patriotism and they're trying to make love for America a bad thing. They're trying to brainwash our kids into hating America through the, through the perverted history they're teaching. What you see at a Trump rally is just pure love for this beautiful country that we have to save. It's the most amazing country in the world and we can't let it go. And I, I just love that I'm watching this movement grow and that people are waking up. You talk about uh, history. What, what would you do on the education side? Because obviously so much of this is related to education. We're watching kids be either intentionally indoctrinated at public schools or intentionally indoctrinated by, you know, woke corporations like Disney. Uh, what would you do on the schooling side? Oh, well, we're, we're about to put out our, our education plan, but I can tell you right now, I, first of all, I signed the Hillsdale 1776 pledge. That's the kind of education we should be teaching our kids. Um, not this woke garbage. And I have two children. One graduated last year from high school. I've got one who's still in high school. So as a parent, as a mom, I'm deeply concerned about the curriculum that's being taught. And I, I, I think really one of the ways to solve that, one of the simplest ways, and President Trump has talked about this, is you fund the student, not the school. So it, it puts power back into the hands of the family gives the family power over where they want to send their kids. And if, if you find out that you're sending your son and your daughter down to the local, you know, the school down the block and they, they're teaching CRT and they're teaching your kids to hate uh, America and they're teaching your kids to question their gender, you can say, no, 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 no. We're pulling our kids out and we're going to bring them to this school. And the money follows your child. And when that happens, I will tell you in a very short order, these schools, mainly the government-run schools, are going to shape up. They're going to realize they're losing enrollment and they're on the verge of extinction if they don't shape up and teach our kids curriculum that actually makes sense, teaches them to be prepared for the real world. It's called competition, right? If all of a sudden the kids are all leaving your school, going to another school, you're going to have to make some adjustments or you're going to go under. Do you think they're too damaged to turn around? So you do the, I'm with you on the, the school that you fund students and set of systems for sure, more private schools, more charter schools, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think there's any chance, even if they saw a massive drop in enrollment, that the public schools would have some value or could come back? Well, if they don't, they'll go the way of uh, the dinosaur. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah. if pretty soon nobody wants to come to your school, you're it's going to be pretty hard. It's going to be pretty hard to stick around. Um, I'm a big proponent of homeschooling. I think we need to support our homeschool families. They've been kind of left out of the equation. I'm on the campaign trail. I'll tell you what, homeschooling is growing. It's growing at a very rapid clip because people were tired of having their kids, you know, school shut down. And then when they went back to school, they had to, you know, abuse the children with these masks. So I'm a big proponent of homeschooling. I think we need to support them as well. But we we need to get really serious about the curriculum. My plan calls for at 10th grade, after 10th grade, we put our kids on a track, a career track, whether they're going to go to a four-year college, a vocational school, whether they want to get a trade skills learned. And we can have our kids graduating at age 18 from senior as senior in high school with a plan for a job. I was just at a school down in Vail, which is down in uh, uh, Tucson area. And they have a welding program they started at their school. And these kids are being hired before they even graduate high school. Obviously, they're finishing high school. But these companies are coming in offering them 70 to 80 plus 70 to 80,000 or more to take on welding jobs. They're learning that skill in high school. They get full benefits. They can actually raise a family someday with that kind of a salary. We need people in the trades really badly. And those are the skills that I think our, our boys want to do. Even our girls want to do those. But I look at sometimes the way we, we uh, educate our boys, and I'm a, I'm a mom to a boy, and I know sometimes he would rather be in a class where he's learning how to weld or he's learning um, some sort of a trade skill and it, his mind and his hands are being worked than sitting there listening to a lecture, especially if a teacher's droning on about CRT or, or you know, switching genders. We got to get our kids ready for the real world. Boys like thing, girls usually like people. It's just, it's reality. It just, it just is what it is. Um, we got a couple couple minutes left, so I want to. I just want to get a couple more in somewhat quickly. So okay, we fix uh, the some of the border stuff. We fix some of the school stuff. So now let's say you're governor. It's February, March, 2023, and uh, Fauci calls you and says, <laughs> uh, "Time to mask everybody up again. Time to shut it down again. Time to socially distance again." How's that call going to go? I don't think he'll call me. I mean, I was the one at the Trump rally when I spoke that said we need to lock that guy up. <laughs> Frankly, we should. I mean, he's lied. If you've read Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s book on, on Fauci, I think I have it sitting right here yeah, behind I'm, me. It, we've got it, it here. It's called The it, yeah. Real Anthony Fauci right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm not being paid to pitch this, but <laughs> every journalist in America should be digging through that and doing stories on this man. He has been more harmful to our health, the health of this country, than probably anybody. And, and frankly, I, I'm, uh, this is not hyperbole. I think the man should be locked up and charged for what he did during COVID. The lies, the lies, he lied to Congress, he lied to the American people. And I would love to see him uh, and facing the music for that. And, and maybe a, a, you know, a, an arrest warrant out for him. Hopefully, maybe in Arizona we can do that. And then he won't want to take a road trip through Arizona and, and stop at a pit stop for a bathroom. We might, we might haul him in. So we're not going to do it. As in Arizona, we're not shutting this state down. I want to make it perfectly clear. As governor of Arizona, I will never shut a business down over COVID. I will never shut your churches down. I will never ch shut the schools down over COVID. And I will never mask our children again over COVID. And we're going to get it to a point where people aren't losing their jobs because they refuse to get one of these jabs that Fauci has been probably making a fortune off of. So we need to get things set straight for the good, hardworking people of this country. And we are not going to be taking a cue from Anthony Fauci. No way. Not in Arizona. Harry, I actually don't think we can end an interview any stronger than that. I think uh, you're not messing around with that guy. <laughs> Let me just say, Dr. Fauci, don't call me. <laughs> you don't want to have that phone call. It's not going to go well for you. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, listen, I am about to embark on a book tour. I am gonna be in your fair state at the Tempe uh, Improv. What's the date on that one, guys? Around May 15th, 16th, something like that. We're gonna send you an invite, and if you could- May 16th. May 16th, I am at the Tempe Improv. And if you're awesome. in town and you wanna come on stage and talk to the people, I'd love to have you. So that I, thank, would be great. I thank you for doing this, and uh, good luck. 
Thank you, Dave. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.